a nightmare crime. They found blood in the sinks, in the bathtub, on the floor. Everything was there that you would use to chop somebody up. A wily suspect with a hidden identity. He was renting to a woman who was clearly a man. I mean, we're talking Tootsie, okay? And a twisted game of cat and mouse that would frustrate law enforcement for more than 20 years. He's gone. Drops off the face of the earth. It had money, it had power, it had cross-dressing, drugs, you name it. A madman millionaire, a mafia princess, and a trail of murders from coast to coast. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Galveston is not the end of the world, but you can almost see it from there. September 2001. A boy and his father are fishing in Galveston, Texas. The kid looks in the water, and there are bags floating, and he sees a torso. And he yells down, there's a body in the water. Police are called to the scene. The head was missing. There were three plastic bags. One contained two arms, one contained a leg, and one contained another leg. Now, anyone not knowing Galveston, throwing something in the water would think, oh, the water will just take it right out. That's not the case in Galveston. Everything comes up. That's the great no question. Several clues are found amongst the grisly remains. There was a receipt from a hardware store where someone had bought a drop cloth and trash bags. There was a cardboard cover from a 699 bow saw. They also found an eviction notice that had the name Morris Black on it. The notice leads police to an apartment in a seedy part of town. So they get to the house and they go through garbage cans. There's a gun, there's ammunition, there was a bloody sock, drop cloths. They, everything was there that you would use to chop somebody up. And sure enough, 71-year-old Morris Black, a handyman and watch repairman, seems to have vanished without a trace. And they get a search warrant and they go into the apartment. What really struck them about Morris Black's apartment was that someone had washed the walls so that even Morris Black's fingerprints weren't there. But the cleaning job was only superficial. Uh, they used luminol and it lights up like a Christmas tree. There had been blood throughout the kitchen. The blood trail leads into the apartment across from Black's. They found blood stains. They found blood in the sinks, in the bathtub, on the floor. They find bloody boots. They find uh, a parry knife. They find a drop cloth. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty grisly scene. Uh, so they're certain that whatever had happened to Morris Black had happened right there in that apartment. The apartment is rented to a middle-aged woman named Dorothy Siner, one of the landlord's oddest tenants. This was a person who appeared to be a man in woman's clothing, wearing a very, very poor quality wig. And the landlord eventually told authorities that he was one of the ugliest uh, women he'd ever seen. Claiming to be a deaf mute, Siner only communicates in writing. She paid her rent several months in advance by money order. Which, for a flea bag place in Galveston, like that's highly unusual. She was from out of town, and the police were trying to find the connection, and they had no record of Dorothy Siner having been in Galveston. This gruesome mystery hit the Texas coast as hard as a hurricane. Everyone wanted to know 
how a hapless handyman ended up in plastic bags, and how the weird lady next door fit into the whole plot. Detectives pursue a new clue recovered from the scene, an optometrist's appointment card for a man named Robert Durst. He had a subsequent appointment to go pick up a pair of eyeglasses. But oddly, police can't find records of a man named Robert Durst anywhere in or around Galveston. They launch a nationwide search for both Durst and Dorothy Siner. They found a woman named Dorothy Siner who was absolutely astounded. Dorothy Siner had never been to Texas, didn't know where Galveston was, and certainly had never rented an apartment there. But there's a connection between Siner and Durst, one that goes decades back. They discover that Dorothy Siner went to school with Robert Durst, and Durst subsequently used her name to rent the apartment. They concluded that Durst, for some reason, was running around dressed as a woman and misrepresenting who he was, and that Durst and, and this Dorothy Siner were the same person. Nine days after the body was recovered, Durst shows up at the eye doctor's office to pick up his glasses, and police are waiting. They pounce, arresting Durst and charging him with the murder of Morris Black. He's taken to the Galveston County Jail, and his bond was set at $300,000, which at that time was a very high bond in Galveston County for any crime, including murder. Certainly high enough for an apparent transient like Durst. They think he's just another itinerant, you know, one of thousands that's living in Galveston. At this point, he's this weirdo drifter who might have hacked up his next door neighbor. But things are not as they appear. Mr. Durst was able to get that bond posted overnight and get released before people realized that he had enough money to, to get out. And then he was gone again. They don't find out until the next day who he really is. They don't know that he's the son of a billionaire from New York. Born in 1943, Robert Durst grew up in Scarsdale, a posh New York suburb, an heir to one of Manhattan's largest real estate companies. They had at the time at least 10 skyscrapers in Manhattan. Their holdings are extensive and they're one of the most powerful and, and uh, influential families in the state of New York. You know, who in a million years would ever think that the heir to this billion dollar real estate empire in New York City would be hanging out in a flea bag, $300 a month apartment in Galveston, Texas, dressing as a woman. Big bucks are no way a guarantee of sanity. In fact, having too much money lying around can do very strange things to people. And this case was looking like no exception. After the Galveston police let Durst free, they discovered that this wasn't the first time he'd been accused of murder. After the bizarre murder and dismemberment of Morris Black in Galveston, Robert Durst makes bail and disappears. It's only then that cops uncover the suspect's disturbing past. In the early 1970s, Durst was rising up the ranks in his family's thriving real estate business. He had a mid-level job in the Durst organization. He managed buildings and he collected rents. One of his tenants was named Kathy McCormick. She was blue collar from Long Island. He was wealthy from New York. They met and they dated and subsequently married. When I first met Kathy, we were both in college. She was a lot of fun. She had a lot of spunk. She was lovely, she was beautiful. She was just a delight. At first, Kathy and Bob seemed to be a perfect match. He was, what, 29, and she was 19 when they were 
first introduced each other and, and you know, he was Prince Charming and she was Cinderella. There was a lot of Studio 54 and Elaine's and all the hot spots and then they become the it couple. There was a posh apartment in Manhattan and a weekend home upstate. She was swept off her feet. And pretty much, I think it would be easy to say that she was probably seduced by the lifestyle of having all of this uh, resource and, and, and power and politics uh, at your disposal. But after a few years, the picture-perfect marriage began to show some cracks. For lack of a better term, you know, he had these weird habits where he would, he would bark or he would yell or he would scream. Um, he acted in a way in which, you know, obviously you're going to notice him, but you're not going to notice him in a good way. He was always, always, um, you know, smoking pot. That was his nature. Uh, a lot of cocaine, a lot of pot. You know, it was one thing that Bobby Durst had always indulged in, and that was smoking pot. It was the 70s. New York is accustomed to eccentric millionaires. And as we've seen, eccentric millionaires can be prone to bad behavior. Before long, Bob Durst would be up to his neck in some very dark and dangerous behavior. After about three or four years, he starts to act a bit bizarre with Kathy. He's getting violent with her. You know, first it was pushing, and then it was punching. Might have been Thanksgiving, where she was sitting on the couch and she wasn't getting up and go leaving fast enough for him. He came back in and he reached down and, and grabbed her by the hair and, and pretty much yanked her up from the couch. She would call me late at night to uh, complain about Bob's violence, to say she was afraid of him. He had sent her to the hospital, but at the same time she was afraid of him, she thought she could handle him. She just thought, well, you know, I'll deal. Kathy began to lead her own life. She didn't want to just be, you know, this rich guy's wife. She wanted to do her own thing. Kathy enrolled in medical school to become a pediatrician. Bob was far from supportive. The more Kathy, you know, became independent, she was this close to a medical degree. The more Bobby couldn't take that. Bobby liked control, and he was losing that control. But somewhere along the line, Kathy went from dissatisfied to downright frightened. The one thing that I'm never going to get out of my head, Ellen, if anything ever happens to me, look to Bob. Bob did it. Don't let him get away with it. <laughs> That's the same thing. <laughs> That's okay. In January 1982, Kathy went to a party by herself. Uh, the story was at the time that Bobby had called her and kept calling her, demanding that she return home. Uh, and around 7 o'clock, she says goodbye to her friend, and she disappears into this snowy night and is never seen again. It wasn't until five days later that Bob Durst finally reported his wife missing. I mean, we checked hospitals, we checked missing person reports, um, the John Doe reports, nothing, zero. I mean, she just went off the face of the earth. Then they subsequently find out that he was throwing out her personal uh, items. He was throwing her books, her medical books, in the garbage. None of his behavior was what you would expect from someone whose wife was missing and he loved her. He was, for all intents and purposes, just um, erasing her from his life. Uh, so the police uh, learn of this pretty quickly, and that's when he becomes their chief suspect. But without a body, police were hamstrung. He killed her. And then he made her disappear, and we never found her body. Doesn't mean we don't know he didn't do it. Bobby speaks to the police, uh, but then he lawyers up. He doesn't want to talk anymore. From that point on, Durst communicated only through an old friend named Susan Berman. They had met years earlier in college, and they became friendly, and they established a bond uh, that they had maintained uh, 
for, for decades. She was incredibly close to Bobby. She adored him. She, she thought he was her brother. Susan always, always was a big supporter of Bobby's. And that never changed through Kathy's disappearance. Susan was a journalist, but her biggest claim to fame was as the daughter of Las Vegas mobster, Davy Berman. Um, Davy Berman was Bugsy Siegel's right-hand man and spent a lot of time in prison for him. And in return, Bugsy Siegel gave Davy Berman the Flamingo Hotel. She was the Eloise of the Flamingo. Going in, everyone knew her, all the dancers knew her, and all the dealers and everyone. They would say hello to her and treat her like a little princess. Berman wrote several books about life in the mob. She didn't repress her roots at all. She was proud of them. You know, Susan had a mob mentality when it came to loyalty. You know, she would have done anything for the people that she was loyal to. She may have even helped Bob get away with murder. One of the weird things that happened was after we now know Kathy disappeared, a phone call was made to the dean of the medical school, a woman claiming to be Kathy Durst, saying, I don't feel well today, I'm not coming to school. Now, first of all, a grown woman in medical school does not call the dean to say, I have a tummy ache. The person who made that call, I believe, was Susan Berman. Susan stepped in, pretended she was Kathy, and made the call. She was covering for Bob. But this wasn't the only phone call that the police would look into. Bobby said that he had been in Connecticut right after Kathy had disappeared, when in fact, according to the phone records, he made a collect call, which we, he was always prone to do, from Ship Bottom, New Jersey. Ship Bottom was familiar to investigators. It was virtually next door to a notorious mob burial ground known as the Pine Barrens. And the collect call was to Susan Berman. Police believe that Bobby had killed his wife. They believe that he brought her down somewhere around Ship Bottom, either to the ocean or to the Pine Barrens. But since there's no direct evidence, it's all circumstantial, um, the case just goes away, as does Bobby. For the next 10 years, Durst flew under the radar. You know, who knows what Bobby Durst is doing? Bobby disappears. He, he's around, but he's not around. He not only had a fabulous home in New York City, he had another one in Connecticut, another one in California. Then, in the early 90s, after his father died, Durst resurfaced and tried to take the reins of the family empire. He's told that he's not going to be uh, running the Durst organization that his younger brother was going to. I mean, this, this says it in a nutshell. His own family is scared of him, wants nothing to do with him. His own family doesn't want to be near him. It was, you know, pretty clear that Bobby was Fredo in the family. <laughs> you know, he wasn't real happy with that. Poor Bobby. Somehow he'd have to get by on the $3 million a year allowance his family paid him to just go away. Unfortunately, a life of luxury wasn't enough to keep him out of trouble. Seventeen years after Kathy Durst's presumed murder, the case is all but forgotten. But then, in the summer of 1999, Joe Becerra, a New York State police investigator, got a tip from a convict, hoping to reduce his prison sentence. He stated uh, that he knew of this girl named Kathy Durst, who was murdered back in 1982 by her husband. And he said that her body was buried under a shed at their lakeside home up in South Salem. The tip turned out to be bogus, but Becerra was intrigued by the case. There were a lot of unanswered questions, and I had an opportunity to 
or at least try to find out what happened to her. It was basically something I couldn't overlook or ignore. My heart soared. I thought, finally, we're going to get somewhere on this. I've waited all these years, and it's, it's going to happen. They get search warrants to search the old cottage, which is now owned by other people. They go back and they interview Kathy's family. They go back and they interview the friends. All of a sudden, everybody's going back and looking for forensic evidence 20 years later. They also revisited the party where Kathy was last seen and gained some new insight into her frame of mind that night. <laughs> She drank two full bottles of wine. She had two grams of Coke. Investigators learned from the host that Kathy and Bob Durst had several heated phone conversations while she was at the party. According to friends, the days leading up to Kathy's disappearance had been fraught with trouble, particularly over finances. She was asking for a couple hundred thousand dollars just to pay off the college bills and maybe have a little bit of money, you know, startup money for her practice. He was a very wealthy guy, but he was as tight as the paper on the wall. He was very cheap. So money, she sometimes had to borrow money from friends. In the days before she dis Kathy disappeared, you know, her friends were pushing her, get out of this. By all accounts, Kathy enjoyed the perks that came with the Durst name. But what is even clearer is that she ultimately wanted out of her marriage to Bob. Rubbing elbows with the rich and famous just wasn't worth it. There's no question that the tension and the arguments had escalated on both sides. I think both of them were hepped up at this time, aided and abetted by some recreational drugs. And Kathy went home spoiling for a fight. And she got one. But what really happened that night remained a mystery. Now, after nearly 20 years, the ice-cold case was heating up. And they now put together uh, what they believe is a case that is moving closer and closer to pinning this, not just a disappearance, but a murder on Kathy's former husband, Bobby Durst. The heat was on Bobby again. After 20 years, suddenly, you know, the heat's back on him. But then the story broke nationwide about the reopening of the case. As soon as those stories were published, Bobby Durst calls down to Galveston, Texas, and rents an apartment for a deaf mute woman named Dorothy Siner. The prosecution is eager to talk to Bobby's lifelong confidant, Susan Berman, and she seems ripe for a frank conversation. She was broke. She couldn't get work. She was really in a bad way. She would talk about buying a chicken and making it last for two weeks and things like that. And she started hitting Bobby up for money, more than usual. Durst sent Berman a check for $25,000. And then after the story of the new investigations come out, he gives her more money. Another twenty-five grand. At the same time, the cops are calling her up to talk about what she remembered from 20 years ago. And it looked like she was getting ready to talk. She had scheduled interviews with both the New York Times and the NYPD. Susan had said that she had some information that was going to blow the top off of things. <laughs> Susan, what do you mean? I just have it and it is going to blow the top off of things. You know, I just said, for God's sakes, please be careful. For years and years and years since Kathy disappeared, Susan's story always was Bobby had nothing to do with it. She started to tell people different things. And to one person she said, I know Bobby did it. How do you know, Susan? How do you know that? He told me. But Berman would never get the chance to tell her story. On Christmas Eve 2000, 
A neighbor heard Susan's dogs barking out of control and called the LAPD. They found her face down in her bedroom and there was a single bullet shot to the back of the head. There is no way on earth that Susan Berman let a stranger into her house that night. She was shot from behind while walking into a back room of the house. She had to trust that person. When I first heard about what had happened, that, yes, it had to be somebody that, that we knew, that she knew at least. Bob Durst. Bob Durst. Tying up some loose ends, killing his best friend to save himself. That's cold. That's cold. There was nothing at the scene to connect Durst to Berman's murder. But credit card records did put him in the area. They tracked Bobby from Eureka, California to San Francisco just a couple of days before Susan died. He subsequently rented a car from San Francisco, drove to L.A., was in L.A. the day Susan Berman was killed. Sheer coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. But once again, police were foiled. It would take death and destruction in Galveston to get them back on the right track. It's mid-October 2001, and investigators in the Morris Black murder investigation are reeling after the disappearance of their prime suspect, Robert Durst. After he jumps bail, he flees. He's gone. Drops off the face of the earth. I mean, that was terrifying to these guys in Galveston because they knew at that point that he had the resources to go anywhere in the world. Police are looking for him in Galveston. Police are looking for him in New York. They've got uh, national APB out for him. But he, he's, he's gone. The story of the cross-dressing millionaire murder suspect is making headlines nationwide. With no clear motive for the alleged murder and dismemberment, people around the country are taking a closer look at their next-door neighbors. I get a phone call from a fellow who says his brother's a landlord in New Orleans. He had a similar situation where he was renting to a woman who was clearly a man. He called himself Diane Winnie, but the landlord thinks he knows his real name. And as it turned out, it was Durst who had rented the apartment in New Orleans. With a bad wig. I mean, we're talking Tootsie, okay? Investigators comb through the New Orleans apartment. And they find all kinds of evidence linking Bobby to this apartment and Bobby masquerading as Diane Winnie. They find computer equipment. They find a medallion uh, that Susan Berman had given Bobby. Um, they find a wig. You know, he's, an, he's a different woman in... New Orleans. One was a redhead. <laughs> you have to keep him straight. So the cops know that Durst was here, and Durst arrived there after he had fled from Galveston. It's hard to gauge whether Bob felt at home in ladies' lingerie or cross-dressed just to elude the law. It wasn't a very plausible disguise, but incredibly, it worked. He could have been outside on my front lawn. Um, he could have been, you know, looking to capture one of my children. He could have been out going after his, his own family uh, members. I mean, you, know, you don't know. Nearly seven weeks go by. It seems as if Robert Durst may never resurface. Then, just after Thanksgiving, investigators catch a break. In Hanover Township, Pennsylvania, the security cameras at this upscale supermarket pick up a guy wandering around, acting suspiciously. The man is odd looking, his head and eyebrows shaved. He gets a newspaper and then he hangs out some more and he goes into the medical area of the store and picks up, picks up a box of band-aids and takes one out. The man then wanders into a restroom comes back out with the band-aid on his face and then he, he goes over to the delicatessen area of the store picks up a 
chicken salad sandwich, then starts wandering out, out the door of the uh, supermarket. The shoplifter is detained by store security. He stopped, police are called. They ask for ID. He was using the identity of Morris Black, his driver's license. But the social security number he gives police is his own. And when police check the number for warrants, they get a hit in Galveston, Texas. That's when they realize that they captured Robert Durst. The elusive millionaire busted over a stolen chicken salad sandwich on Pumpernickel. How ironic. It seemed the jig was up, but this twisted plot would turn again. Investigators come to realize the shaved head and eyebrows are Durst's attempt to look more like the 71-year-old man he's impersonating. He had rented a car under Morris Black's name. And his car is searched, and they find $37,000 in cash. They find two thirty-eight caliber handguns. They find a wad of pot in the back of the car. And he also had $500 in his pocket. And keep in mind that he stole a $7 sandwich. Robert Durst is again in police custody. I, I really and truly felt that, well, you know, like, like all of us felt that finally uh, a very, um, you know, sad chapter in our lives was, was, was nearing an end. I was thinking finally it's over. We're finally going to get him. If we didn't get him for one crime, we're going to get him for another crime. Four months after Morris Black's dismembered body floated up from Galveston Bay, the prosecution begins building their case against Robert Durst. They wanted him. They wanted him bad. This guy had outmaneuvered them or tried to at every turn. You've got a chopped up body. You've got the suspect. You've got all the evidence that came from the apartment. He fled. You know, this is a no. This is a win-win situation for prosecutors. As the police in Galveston said, "GM, it's a slam dunk in terms of you know murder one, you know the the, uh, the charge sticking." The word going around Galveston was that the notorious cheapskate coughed up a two million dollar retainer for the best defense team in town. They made the prosecution realize they needed to pull a rabbit out of the hat. So they sent a team of police divers to try and pull Morris Black's severed head out of Galveston Bay. The importance of finding the head of the victim would show the reason and or cause of death Private investigator Bobby Baca is hired by the victim's family to help in that mission. I bet if you found that head, you'd see the entrance wound of the bullet was behind. The same way that Susan Berman was killed. With a bullet hole right to the back of her head. While dive teams scour the bay, speculation swirls over the motive. Durst was only suspected in the murders of people he knew. So what was the connection to Black? One of the questions that still drives me crazy is just, you know, did, did he know him before? You know, how did he end up next door to this guy? These two guys did not just end up in Galveston, Texas, living next door to each other. It just doesn't, doesn't work like that. It's clear at least in my mind, that they knew each other. Some investigators suspect that Susan Berman was their connection. Was Morris Black even a member of the mob? Was he so? Was he a hitman or something like that? You know, was he a member of the Jewish mafia? Baca theorizes that Black helped Durst kill and dispose of his wife. I think that Kathy disappearing as completely as she has disappeared is similar to the way mobsters would make 
dead bodies disappear. Um, it happens all the time in their world. The grim search for Morris Black's head proves to be futile. Then the dream team drops a bombshell. Durst will admit to killing Morris Black in self-defense. Yeah, he chopped him up, he killed him, he chopped him up, he dumped him in the bay, but it was self-defense. And not only that, this poor guy has been hounded by people who suspect him and other things, so he wasn't acting rationally. Self-defense? for carving up a senior citizen on your kitchen floor. This was the ultimate in Gaul. In late September 2003, the trial kicks off. It had all the elements that you could possibly want. It had money, it had power, it had cross-dressing, drugs, alcohol, you name it. The prosecution opens with a bang. They have the blood evidence. They have the, you know, the bloody um, floor. They have the receipts in the bag. They have the body parts with the addresses on it. Is it well planned and calculated? You bet it is. Step by step, they recount the horrible circumstances of Black's murder and dismemberment. Well, the prosecution presented probably as gruesome a, a, a scenario as anyone's ever presented to a jury anywhere in this country. They claim that a vicious beating precipitated Morris Black's murder. And we're talking before he was even dismembered. He had a heart attack. There were bruises on his body, blood in his lungs. There were cuts over his body. You can't take the iceberg away from the Titanic, and you can't take away what he did some more black. It, it was a, a horrible scene that they were able to, to lay out, uh, particularly the, the prolonged nature of the process of cutting up the body. Things like what this killer did just are never going to make sense. By the time the prosecution rests, the case against Durst looks like a lock. The fact that he tried to cover up the crime, the fact that he jumped bail, all of this stuff, but you don't flee when you're innocent. The state put on a great case, but Bob Durst wasn't giving up. And the defense was about to stage a show that would change everything. The prosecution in the Durst murder trial has put on a powerful case. Now it's the defense's turn, and they come out swinging. This case is not about what Bob Durst did after Morris Black died. Part of their tactic is to blame the victim and transform Durst from a psycho killer into a likable guy. Well, you know, his attorneys would always say, my friend Bob, good old Bobby. It wasn't Mr. Durst, it was my friend Bob. You know, we'll put our arm around him. I've seen this kind of courtroom drama a million times before. It all comes down to the same ugly tactic. Turn the accused into a victim and turn the victim into a monster. The defense argues that Morris Black was foul-tempered, unstable, and that Durst suffers from Asperger's syndrome, a mild form of autism, which caused his bizarre behavior. And they put him on the stand which actually was a stroke of genius on their part. And he knew he had to somehow explain why he had cut up a human body, but yet had not murdered the person who was cut up. And he did a heck of a job of it. He tells the jury that on the day of the murder, he found Black in his apartment with a gun. Black knew that Durst had weapons in his apartment. He said that Black had pulled one of the weapons on him and that he and Black struggled over the weapon. Durst testifies that the gun accidentally discharged in Black's face as he was trying to defend himself. Durst claimed that he panicked, that he was afraid of having the police come and find a dead body and 
The apartment? His story was self-defense. But, you know, because everybody suspected me for the other murders, they're going to suspect that I did this on purpose. I need to do something. I need to cover this up. Claiming he was in a haze of drugs and alcohol, Durst details his final heinous step for the jury. He just remembers swimming in a pool of blood. He really didn't remember what had happened other than the fact that he had to dismember this body. He had a dead body. Uh, it was brilliant. I mean, if I ever kill anybody, that's who I'd want to represent me. The jury deliberates for an excruciating 26 hours. The longer it went on, in terms of deliberations, you, you, you're saying, what are they talking about? What are they questioning here? Mr. Foreman, I understand you have a verdict. Yes, we hand it to the bailiff. Finally, after four days, they reach a decision. Will the defendant please rise? With the jury, find the defendant, Robert Durst, not guilty. And when the verdict came out, Bobby Durst was more surprised than I was. We also thank the jury for your sacrifice and your time. And, uh... What can I say? I mean, I said to myself, he got away with it again. I, I basically almost dropped on the floor. It's like he walks on water when it comes to stuff like this. I was almost in, in shock disbelief because we had been so, um, you know, been built up uh, and reassured by the law enforcement folks in Texas that, you know, this is a slam dunk. He wasn't charged with cutting up a corpse. He wasn't charged with any other crime. So the jury had to find Durst guilty of first-degree murder or nothing at all. Essentially, the jury was left with the idea that there were two kind of nutty guys in a room with a gun and that anything could have happened, including self-defense. And they were stuck. Robert Durst served less than three years for gun possession, bond jumping, and evidence tampering. He now lives his life as a free man. In 2006, Bob Durst legally severed ties to his family and walked away with a $65 million payout. Plenty of scratch for new dresses. So if a strange-looking mute woman moves in next door to you, you better watch your back. For True TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.